Now it is my pleasure to introduce Jane Johnston, our guest speaker for today. Jane graduated from Florida Gulf Coast University in 2016 with her Bachelor of Arts degree in Environmental Studies. She spent her college years volunteering as a shorebird shore steward and interning with the Wings of Hope Panther Posse, which is Panther education for fourth and fifth graders. Her first position with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission was part-time as the first panther outreach specialist. That's very cool. Jane later transitioned into her current role as a statewide wildlife assistance biologist and started educating the public, not just about panthers, but also about bears, bobcats, coyotes, snakes, bats, and more. Jane enjoys volunteering with the F-STOP Foundation as their volunteer coordinator. Good. So thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. So you are attending a talk about the F-STOP Foundation, and our tagline is Photograph, Educate, Conserve. I'm going to be going over quite a bit of that and hopefully showing you some really cool videos today. We're a small crowd, so if you have questions as we go along, just let me know. So I'm going to talk a lot about um, how do we accomplish the photograph part to educate people and lead them to the next step in conservation, and that is through our remote cameras. So I have an example of one here. Remote cameras are also called trail cameras or game cameras are motion activated cameras that you actually set up out in uh, the wild or in your backyard. You could do that too. <laughs> so you strap it to a tree after you've programmed it and put some batteries in it and a photo card. And then as humans or wildlife walk by, the motion sensor picks up the activity and turns the camera on. And so it will record videos or stills or a little bit of both. Uh, so this is how we get a lot of our imagery that I'm going to share with you today. And we use these images um, to promote conservation of wildlife. Uh, so as we capture different types of species in these videos and pictures, then we're able to educate people about them and what their conservation needs might be. So we're going to talk about how these efforts are helping today's conservation-focused um, projects. And it's me that, as um, Andy introduced me, I'm the volunteer coordinator for the F-STOP Foundation. And What's important about that is we do depend a lot on volunteers. So if you're looking for something fun to do, feel free to come join us. <laughs> so what is our mission? Our mission is to create a positive awareness in conservation through the use of photography. So most of Florida's wildlife is afraid of you. Um, so you trying to use a point and click camera or a nice camera, because I have more of a point and click, I don't know about it, point and shoot, um, is harder to do because the wildlife's afraid of you. So what we get to do through the trail cameras is actually get glimpses of wildlife in their natural habitats, doing natural things, normal things, without the influence of people. So we get to see the secret lives of wildlife. <laughs> um, so we work in Florida, but we also work globally. So I, and I'm going to be sharing uh, some of those projects as we go along and move through the presentation. So we're not just here, we're almost everywhere. <laughs> so some of our projects and how do we support these different programs, uh, we have the Crossings and Corridors project that I'm going to spend a lot of time on, as well as the Sharing the Landscape project, and our award-winning short films, of which we have two currently out, and you can find those on our YouTube channel, and of course more short films are in production as we speak. So let's talk about one of our global partners. This is the Wild Tomorrow Fund. And we partner with them by supplying trail cameras and the necessary equipment to operate those, which includes a case and cable locks, the SD cards, um, and usually they get their own batteries. And they are based out of South Africa. So the project, the first project we partner with them on is pangolins. If you're unfamiliar with the pangolin, it is one of the most illegally trafficked animals in the world for its scales. Uh, but we know very little about them. So you've got to learn more about the pangolin and how can you do it? Using trail cameras. So this will help us understand more about their habits. Where do they feed? Where, where do they breed? Where do they make baby pangolins? Um, you know, and how big of a space do they need? What are their conservation needs? Because they are being pretty severely poached for their scales. So what can we do not only to support 
uh, the pangolins and try to understand more about their conservation needs, but also the people that are involved in these kind of efforts in South Africa. So we've donated some cameras to that project to go along with the trackers that are now being applied to pangolins. And there's a picture of a pangolin there in the bottom right. I think it looks pretty darn cute with its little plates on. So now we're able to learn more about them. That We're supporting the Wild Tomorrow Fund to do that so that they can put some conservation measures in place to increase the population of this animal. Sometimes when you put trail cameras out there in the wild, you're expecting to get pictures of pangolins, but sometimes you get other pictures like this one. <laughs> so uh, we get to see the secret lives of animals. And so this is a picture, and I'm not up to date on my African species of wildlife, so <laughs> forgive me for that. But yeah, so what's interesting about this photo is it is a little bit of a flash going on there. If you were to walk by a trail camera, and most times you're not going to hear it at all, uh, but the wildlife does. So in this case, probably the flash is prompted to look at the actual camera itself. So we were able to take this beautiful photo. So sometimes you get bonus images when you are supporting conservation efforts. Uh, the other partnership we have with them involves the black rhinoceros. So these are being poached at an alarming rate. We know other rhinoceros species have already gone extinct, and their horns are being harvested. Well, the easiest way to harvest the horn is to kill the animal. Uh, but if you harvest a horn from a rhino, it'll actually grow back. So we, this partnership has two purposes. One is, of course, to learn about its habits, foraging, breeding, uh, sheltering grounds, where does it spend most of its time, how much space does it need. But the second part of this is about the horn. So you can harvest the horn off of a living rhinoceros, but you need a lot of anesthesia. You need an expert uh, marks person to be able to dart the rhino. Then you have to rent the helicopter and the helicopter pilot. Then you have to assemble the veterinarian and everybody has to get mobilized on the ground once the rhinoceros goes to sleep. Um, so they can harvest the horn. Then they have to make sure it wakes back up and it moves off into its environment. To harvest one rhinoceros horn costs about $10,000. So we're supporting the efforts for cameras on the conservation end, but we're hoping that the imagery of the rhinoceros will also encourage some fundraising efforts because that's a lot of money to just get one horn <laughs> to supply the market. And then we're trying to keep the poachers whole at the same time. The Wild Tomorrow Fund's working with local people. They're not getting rich off of these efforts. They're just trying to feed themselves and their families. So we're trying to save the wildlife and preserve the economic well-being of the families that are also there. We have partnered with uh, Yellowstone Cougar Project. And so they are collaring and capturing some imagery of cougars. Now, how have we supported this effort in Yellowstone National Park? We've donated over 130 trail cameras to their program. And this includes the standard camera that I just showed you, but also cameras that have modems attached. Modems give you real-time pictures. So it's set up to, uh, by, and from a satellite feed, and it will send you the images as soon as they are taken. So most of these images are coming to you at 3 a.m. on email. I don't know if you're a sensitive sleeper, you might wake up, but that way they're, if they need to address something more immediately, they can get the information very quickly through the modems. So that's one way we've done it. Security boxes, because we were talking earlier with uh, Becky here, and what happens to some of those cameras is they get smashed by wildlife. This happens, especially bears. I'm not sure why they're so offended by getting their picture taken. <laughs> and then we provided locks too, because people also steal cameras. Um, you know, so I don't know if that means they're necessarily doing something they shouldn't be out there, but uh, the cameras will walk off and then you'll just, you don't know what happened. <laughs> so, and that, the cameras aren't necessarily really cheap. And then we've also supplied SD cards to this project as well. We've let them take care of getting their own batteries. And hopefully this video will play so you can see a little bit of the imagery that our cameras have been able to, to catch. Someone hit the next button and see, there we go. So it's kind of cool, secret lives <laughs> of wildlife. And so if a person was there, they would probably never get to see something like that. So 
<laughs> All right. So now let me bring it back. Um, so we went to South Africa. We went out to Yellowstone. Let's bring it back to Florida a little bit. So what are the kind of projects that we're working on here? We're working on our own Puma Kung Flora, the Florida panther. It's not just about the Florida panther because it is also about all the other species that live in its habitat and us too. And so this is one of our earlier uh, photographs that uh, were taken by our cameras when we started back in 2016. Right now, we have over 140 cameras in South Florida, and that's starting out from the east-west portion of I-75 and going all the way north to Orlando. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of cameras and a lot of imagery that we are collecting. We have 11 field technicians. Um, so only one of those field technicians is actually compensated for the work. All of the other 10 field technicians are volunteers. So they're hiking out there and slogging through the woods, mostly on trails, so it's a little bit easier, you know, but they're going to go out in the middle of the Florida heat. They're going to go out with the threat of thunderstorms. They're pulling the photo cards. They're putting new batteries in these cameras. They're uploading the photos. So most of our field techs are doing it for the, <laughs> for the enjoyment of it, but also they know that when they get to look at the images, they walk the same path as these animals as well. So we've got... 11 technicians on board. We have at any given moment more than 50 volunteers supporting our efforts. Uh, so this largely is volunteer supported. So there are only a couple compensated people that work for the F-STOP Foundation. The rest of us are doing this because we believe in its mission. We believe in what they do. So most of those volunteers do come from Florida Gulf Coast University because the university requires students to perform uh, acts of service and to be educated and learn from the community partner. And we've been able to partner with them starting in the fall semester of 2020. And they've done an excellent job with helping us manage all our images so that we can use them to educate people about conservation. We now to kind of grasp how much imagery do we have exactly? So we have 13 terabytes of storage being used up by our images right now. So most people as individuals will never even touch one terabyte of storage. So this is a lot of imagery, a lot of data. We consider this our science collection, our data. So it's a lot, it's a lot to manage and we're very thankful for our volunteers that help us do that. So <laughs> we do uh, share what we have with partners. So we have shared some of our videos with the FWC uh, to help them monitor for a disease of unknown origin that they have termed feline leukomyopathy or FLM. Um, it affects panthers and bobcats both. Uh, they started seeing it show up um, around the 2017-2018 timeframe because of other programs that have trail cameras in natural spaces out here in South Florida and saw that what looked like um, some difficulty with walking. So let's see if you can see that at the end. This is imagery from April of 2019. So if you just watch closely at the second um, panther that's going to walk behind mom, that's mom in the front and her uh, number is FP224. You can see kind of had a little wiggle and it's a little wobbly there. So necropsy wise, any panthers that are, uh, that die and are recovered by the FWC get an animal autopsy performed on them, a necropsy. And they were finding lesions on the spines of some of those animals, but they didn't understand what that meant to them while they were living. And this is what it means because they've been able to now study animals where they see the wobble and recover the carcass and saw the lesions on the spine. We just still don't know what happened. So do the panthers always, uh, are they always impacted by this? They can be. So this is the kissing four months later. There's mom, FP224. She has quite the story. I would suggest looking her up online somewhere. Now this is an animal that is dependent on its back legs to launch itself forward 30 feet to be able to uh, get its food, harvest its prey, which is usually deer, um, and hogs. So if your back legs are immobile or are there some injury or disease that are affecting them, it makes you a less effective predator and you can't feed yourself nearly as well. So it's still studies ongoing. We still continue to share imagery, not just of panthers, but of bobcats with the FWC to try to help them understand what's the origin of this issue. We still do not know. They've ruled out a lot of things, but they haven't figured out what has caused it just yet. And that's a statewide issue too. It's not just here in South Florida.
So I'm going to move on from the sharing our imagery with the FWC and talk about one of our partnerships and one of our projects. So crossings and corridors project. So our partnership on the crossing side of that is the Florida Department of Transportation. And what we offered uh, to do for them was to put cameras in areas where we drive over dry land in the winter and wet filled canals and ditches in the summer. So what we're collecting, our imagery is the data they're using. If the wildlife is using in the dry season, but that area becomes completely flooded in the wet season, now the animal, instead of being able to crawl under the road for its own safety and for the safety of drivers, now has to cross on the top of the road. So is there a way they can modify that uh, underneath area so that the wildlife can still use it in the wet season. So you got to prove that they're using it in the dry season first, and then the DOT has to put together their budgeting and their information to, to say, okay, yes, we need to make these places wildlife underpasses. So far, the efforts from Highway 29 to US 41 and up through Sebring, there are two Sorry, there are 10, not two, boy, two is small, 10 actual wildlife passes within uh, fencing that will be built. Now, how do they make that happen? Uh, and I'll show you in the next slide. So the crossings part is the FDOT. The corridors part, before I move on, is the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation. Uh, they've been working as a not-for-profit with the government for a couple decades on setting aside enough green space that if a Florida panther or a Florida black bear wanted to leave the Everglades and go to Georgia, that it would find enough green space. It would find food, shelter, and mates during the entire travel and also safe passage. And they were successful last year because Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law the Florida Wildlife Corridors Act, which dedicates $400 million to purchase 18 million acres of land. So that's a long process, uh, but is finally going to become a reality for our wildlife. So let's look at how the crossing part of this could work. So you can see in real time, you've got a truck driving over the road. Dry season, the bobcat is able to use the underneath of this uh, roadway. But what happened in the wet season, this bobcat would have to cross over the road and likely would not survive that trip. So how they can modify the underneath part of this road is they can build up a wall or a shelf. So it's beneath the road, but above the water line, and the animals are still able to use it. And that provides safety for wildlife, but also for people. If you, if you were to hit a full-grown bear or a full-grown panther with your vehicle, sometimes your vehicles are totaled and, and, and disabled. You can't even drive away from the incident. So this is addressing two things there, people and wildlife. So here is the bobcat underneath the, uh, the underpass or underneath the roadway. Now, this is a flash photography image, and we can see that its eyes are a little bit dilated. And we have seen some evidence where the flashes could be a little bit disturbing to our wild animals. So the F-stop is working on different techniques to get high quality images that don't involve flash photography. Even though they make for great images, they do alter the animal's natural behavior. And that's not what we want to do. We're trying to conserve its natural behavior and its natural environment. We don't want to discourage it from using the underpass right? We're trying to get them to use the underpass. So we're looking into different techniques to help us do that a little bit more. And so here is, you know, mascot. This is the Florida Panther this is called FP260, uh, Florida Panther 260. You can see he's wearing a boy. Um, he actually did get hit by a car. And um, I'm going to flip to the next one so you don't have to look at the like that. So he was actually hit by a car, but he had minor injuries. He went to Class Animal Hospital at the University, where he recovered and was fitted for a collar and re-released into the wild, which is now where he lives. And now that he has a collar on, we can see he's using every underpass available to him in his territory, which includes the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge, uh, possibly some parts of Big Cypress, some of, the, uh, some of the private ranch lands also that are out east of 29 and north of that area as well. So FP260 so far has not crossed the road and gotten hit again. Hopefully he won't. <laughs> of course, we'll know about it, but hopefully he won't. Hopefully he'll keep using the underpass. But not just panthers use underpasses. Everything uses an underpass. We get birds and otters and opossums and mice and rats and raccoons. If you can think about what lives in South Florida, it uses it too, like our alligator friend. Large alligator like this, if you hit it with the car, you might 
you might not necessarily drive away or, or you might drive away with some damage. So, so important for these, for these guys too. So alligators were once an endangered species. They had a lot of conservation efforts thrown at them and they were able to recover and are doing quite well, but we still wanna provide safety for them and for people on the riverways. So the next project I'm gonna talk about is sharing the landscape. And our partner in this program is the Florida Wildlife Federation. Uh, they're a not-for-profit that works on land conservation efforts. And so they applied for a grant from Florida Power and Light and they were able to purchase cameras. And then in this case, instead of studying animals at the corridor or underneath roadways, we're studying animals in people's backyards. What are we trying to do with that information? Well, those cameras are primarily in the backyards of people that live along Corkscrew Road. So Bella Terra, Corkscrew Shores, and the Pearl River Corkscrew. Those communities back up to tens of thousands of acres of public land that will never be developed. So all of the wildlife is living there, but they also used to live in those communities before those homes were built. Do they stop living there? No. They still use those people's yards. They still use uh, the community as part of their territory, their habitat. That's where they've always lived. So the concept of sharing the landscape is showing people that the wildlife is using your yard and your community in just in a different time space than when you're using it. So both of you can share the landscape together and both of you benefit and neither one is harmed. So here's some images. So can you imagine that you're looking out your back porch and you see this walk across your backyard. I'd be pretty excited when I get to see our raccoons and armadillos. <laughs> you can see the, the nice, nice landscaped grass right here going right up to the curb. So the animals still use these. Areas. And that's where we're trying to introduce people to the concept of sharing the landscape. That is really the future of Florida's conservation. And more and more that we build into their habitats, they're learning to adapt to us we should learn to adapt to them too. So here's a photo from the backyard. How many of you would like a panther in your backyard? Me, okay. <laughs> it can be intimidating and surprising if you don't know it's there. But once you can see the imagery and that it's just living its best life out there, uh, I think that you can may hopefully be a little bit more tolerant about it it's there. But what else do you get? You don't just get panthers. Panther's primary food, which are deer, and hanging out in your backyard, eating some beautiful grass that you've planted. So they'll come out from the edges of those preserves and the woods that surround you. You're pretty. <laughs> so we get 60 or 90 seconds. So now, how do we create this awareness? You know, how are we supporting our conservation partners? Things like this today. So we get to talk to people about the imagery that's inside of the picture. What are the conservation needs for this animal? And then hopefully that'll lead you to the next step in conservation. What might that be? It could be supporting other conservation partners. So we're partnered with, um, we share our information with the Defenders of Wildlife or with, like we sort of talked about the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation. Um, conservation Collier, like there's a lot of partnerships that we have involved and I have a slide that will talk about those. So you could participate with any of those as a volunteer or fundraising, or you could help by uh, contacting legislators to make sure that budgeting gets approved and keeps moving forward to purchase that land for that corridor, um, those kind of efforts. So about, what can I tell you about this little kitten right here? This is a panther kitten. They are born with very large and dark spots. Um, and that helps them camouflage in their den, which is under saw palmetto. So the saw palmettos, the dead leaves are on the bottom, very brown, like their tan fur. And then there's a lot of dirt there. So it looks a lot like dirt, those little spots. So they camouflage very well in there for the, usually the first two months of their lives. So this kitten needs all the help it can get. Only 33% of kittens born survive. So most kittens are lost before they become mature adults to make more baby panthers. So, so they have a lot of conservation needs. Roadways, it's, that's one of their uh, largest uh, issues is getting hit by cars. And of course, we all know that we're all impacted by habitat loss. So, so conservation needs, here's mom with her kittens. And so now, nowadays, being born, if there's a collared female, they're able to go into the den and make sure that the kittens are healthy because there was a time just 30 or so years ago when they weren't. And to see, are they boys or girls? What they're finding 
are more males being born. And that probably has a lot to do with the number of panthers we have in this area, uh, somewhere between 120 and 230. And so giving birth to more males gets them to disperse further away and get out of their dad's territory, because that's what they're going to need to do to survive. And they got to find their own girlfriends and make their own baby kittens. Um, so they're going to have to travel a lot to do that. And as they travel, they're going to run into other male panthers. They're going to run into a lot of roadways as they travel around. If they get north of the Apache River, they tend to ping pong a lot in the state because they're not finding the females north of there. We've only documented a couple um, since uh, 1973. There's only been a couple documented back in uh, 2017 and 18, but we haven't seen much of them since then. So females don't move as far away as the males. And so here's a, another picture and the reason why it's important for us to look into the alternative ways to capture beautiful images without using flash photography, because this cat has become very curious about this camera, makes for a very beautiful photo, but it's looking at the picture instead of following its mom and its sibling back uh, along the trail. So we wanted to keep doing whatever it was doing when the camera turned on. We want it to continue its natural behavior. So developing different ways to be able to study them, research them, and conserve them in, the, in this way. And then if you've never heard how panthers communicate, um, sometimes you just get fun images you can look at too. Those now. So this is a panther kitten. Let's see if you can. I don't know if you guys can out there. All right. So it's essentially what that's doing is it's chirping. It almost sounds like a bird calling and it's talking to its mom. It's communicating to its mom. So they are the only cat that actually purrs and does not roar. Actually purrs and does not roar. So we'll see if we can get the volume. You want me to go back and do that one again? Let's do it. Well, the good news is I know we can't hear it here at no. Yeah, I couldn't really hear it, but that's okay. But that's okay. The good news is that that's on YouTube also. So while you're checking this video back out of this talk today, you can find all of the videos I've showed you on our channel as well. So and if you want to know how to find that after the talk, let's just let me know. I'll help you find that. So we get those kind of images where we've got our panther kittens calling for their moms. And then we get to see fun things, things that we already know about these cats. Um, but then we actually get to see it live and in person. No, noise, no sound for this one, I should say. Now that's probably about a five to six foot fence. They can jump about 15 feet um, from a sitting position. So this isn't unusual. Apparently it didn't want to have to deal with going over the fence. It was just like, eh, just hop over here. And it's super quiet, right? They got to be to catch your food. And then, okay, so something to know about me, I love birds. I really love birds. So I had to throw some bird things in here too. <laughs> but you do get to see the secret lives of birds. For those of you, a bird nerd like me, these great horned owls, and those are actually babies. Um, they're almost as big as their parents, and they look like they're playing with a pine cone there. They're practicing on how to hunt on their own um, under parental supervision there. So, but they're pretty fluffy and downy looking. Um, see, like this is something, if they heard you coming on the trail, they would fly back in a tree. And usually you never even know they're there because they're really quiet. see that they're they're a little clumsy with the way they're trying to fly. Their muscles aren't quite fully developed. And then you get still images that are pretty cool. This is a barred owl, uh, probably hunting some type of toads or frogs in the water. So it's got its one foot down and one foot stuck uh, up in the air. But look at that wingspan compared to the body length. Yeah, and they're, they're very good at hunting at night. So they have some specialized skills to be able to do that. Um, 
so specialized that in complete darkness, because this is out in a public land um, in the OK Slough, Spirit of the Wild area, no lights out there at all, except maybe some moonlight or some stars. Um, and this, and it can see this juvenile black crowned night heron. They like to eat crawfish and crabs and shrimp, and we do have freshwater shrimp too. So it's attempting to catch it. I'm not sure that it was successful because the black crown night heron saw it and it's like, oh, evade, got to evade. So flies away. We don't have another picture after this one though. So I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> so uh, Andy was nice enough to talk about all the events that are going on uh, this Saturday. And we're actually going to be at one with our partner, the Florida Wildlife Federation. Meredith Budd and I will be hosting a table there. And then she'll be hosting uh, the viewing of our short film, Sharing the Landscape. So if you want to join us at Cambier Park, I don't know the timing of the film. Uh, that's something we probably look up online. I don't know what time they're showing it, that they'll show the short film. Um, there'll be some discussion. And then her and I will be at the table if you want to come by. And uh, talk to us in person. I want to thank all of our partners, all of our supporters. Um, you know, this effort isn't done alone. Conservation is something we all do together. Uh, so Hunt's uh, photos and videos can supply your camera needs. They've been a great uh, supporter of the F-Stop Foundation. Moultrie and Browning are uh, leading companies in trail camera imagery, and they've been kind enough to offer us their trail cameras at a discount. Um, so you can purchase trail cameras from them too. We even have videos on our YouTube channel that'll teach you how to program them and set them up. So you can put some in your own backyards and find out who walks around your yard in the dark. Um, Conservation Collier, we have our cameras out there. We talked about the Wild Tomorrow Fund. Florida Wildlife Corridor, uh, the Florida for the Yellowstone Forever. We've donated point and shoot cameras to that organization to help promote more middle and high school student engagement at Yellowstone National Park, especially in the underprivileged community. So we are trying to do conservation of wildlife, but also keeping people in mind as well. And with that, I want to thank you for attending this talk, either uh, virtually or here or hopefully later by YouTube. Um, and certainly check out our website, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. We have a lot of great videos out there. I've only shown you a tiny piece of what we do. So both for short films are available there and we can always use more followers, likes, shares, and tweets on all our social media platforms. So now if we've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer those for you. And if you are enjoying this on YouTube, please like and subscribe for more. Yeah, there are several different trail camera manufacturers. Moultrie and Browning are the ones that have been working with us to give us a discount on purchasing the cameras to support conservation efforts. Uh, the question is about how do you get the wildlife to use the wildlife underpass with fencing? Well, the fencing helps direct them there. So that's part one. But how do you attract them there? So usually it's you plant plants. This is where the Native Plant Society can come in of what our native wildlife eats. So if you put things in there that deer want to eat, they start to use it. The predator follows them right in there. So that's the best way to get the wildlife to use it is by making it more natural. Because if you do anything like leaving meat out, that's for, the, for wildlife, that's unnatural, like, right? Because they, they hunt the animals and they harvest them whole with the fur and all. So yeah, so it's about planting plants that attract the prey and that the prey attracts the predator. Yeah, great question. Yes, we do. Mostly Moultrie and Bushnell. And then there are, those are the more basic of our trail camera setups. And William could probably speak a little bit more to the HD DSLR setups with the flashes, because that, that involves like five or six pieces of equipment. Um, and that's where Hunts comes in, because they've been able to support us uh, with that in the development of that, those other techniques to get the imagery without using the flash. So, well, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it.